Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Lifting from a position paper delivered at the Guso Institute Conference on Effective Policing Strategies for Nigeria, the late social reformer, Professor Claude Ake, was quoted somewhere as saying that Nigeria is over-politicized but under-governed. That presentation in question was delivered by the gentleman who is now joining us for a conversation on why insecurity may remain a problem for the long term in Nigeria if closer attention is not paid to the unique characteristics of our component parts. In addition, you will be looking at the cost of growing insecurity on the country's diplomatic cloud and what he thinks President Burari should be doing and saying at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Professor George Obiozo is an accomplished diplomat. He's a former director general of the Nigerian Institute of Nigerian International Affairs. He was the country's high commissioner to Cyprus, ambassador to Israel, as well as Nigeria's ambassador to the United States. Prof, thank you. It's good to see you again on the morning show. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm thank glad you. to be here. Yes, Prof, let's start with uh, the report by the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, extrajudicial killings and arbitrary uh, executions. Now, Agnes Kalamad was here for about 12 days between uh, August and uh, September. And then she submitted a preliminary report in which she said Nigeria is a pressure cooker of generalized violence, uh, widespread insecurity, uh, extrajudicial killings. I mean, all kinds of, I mean, reading paragraph eight of her report, you would think Nigeria is uh, such a big problem. And she concludes by saying, if something is not done, Nigeria could become a threat to the West African sub-region and to the African continent. Well, I don't think that uh, we should uh, jump into conclusion either to condemn or ignore the report. Because it takes a long process for the UN to appoint a rapporteur to any country. As a matter of fact, this is not the first time that Nigeria has had a problem of uh, security or accusation of uh, extrajudicial killing. In fact, uh, under Abacha, remember the issue of uh, Kesarawi and others, Nigeria was about to be sanctioned by the UN Human Rights Commission. It, it was almost there. But um, preventive diplomacy solve the problem of the embarrassment it could have caused. I think uh, in one way or the other, the rapporteur's report, or even the appointment of a rapporteur, is probably a challenge to the government, serious challenge. It is a, 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 a wake-up call. Because the issue of insecurity, is, the government itself knows it, spoken about it, and many prominent Nigerians have spoken about it. What has remained problematic is a matter of expectations and perceptions of the government and its capacity to meet the challenge. Why do you say that that has been problematic, though? Because the expectations have been problematic. How, how could they have been? In a sense, the international community, as well as to say some extent, the people, but political elite and the intellectuals or publicists in Nigeria, including journalists like you people, have been dealing with the issue of how can we control the challenge of insecurity in the country. And it seems to be difficult either to define or to control. There is a problem. I will just put it in a proverb. If we have a general, as is, as head of state, in fact, one of the major reasons that President Buhar was immediately uh, supported by some members of the international community. 
and even Nigeria was to deal with the issue of that he has the capacity, the knowledge, the experience to deal with the issue of insecurity. But despite that, this, he's still struggling with security. Definitely. Four or five, going to five years after his regime. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. You cannot have a hawk. And you still have menacing chickens for that long. That is a matter of perception. Once the perceptions about a new regime is wrong or mistaken or controversial, then you have a problem we have today. Well, Prof, I mean, uh, the federal government of Nigeria has responded to the uh, report by the special rapporteur. And, you know, the position, as expressed by uh, Karu Bashir, is that it's a disappointing report and that the report does not take uh, uh, notice of uh, other important uh, factors, like cattle rustling, like intra-community violence, and that thereby, you know, whereas there is violence in Nigeria, truly, uh, it's not a reliable report. Uh, do you think that that is the appropriate response, considering the fact that Agnes Kalamad herself, in her concluding paragraph, says she would like the Nigerian government to take note of some of her recommendations and that she will be available to provide necessary support if Great. need be. Great. In fact, the, 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 the response of Nigeria that I want to refer to is the one on the back page, on uh, uh, front page or, or back page, back, back, page. back page of this day of Sunday, 22nd of September. He says, as a report to the rapporteur, if you are going to address violence and the general insecurity in Nigeria, in Nigeria, incidents everywhere should be part of the narrative. That is unquote. Well, this is not the kind of response that we Nigerians or the international community can go with. We can explain to ourselves and explain to others that our government effort to control the challenge, not to be in denial. When we say the world has become a global village, it means that there is nothing anymore that is the only domestic or internal affairs of any country, especially issues of security, because the definition of these issues have become international. Security is no longer an issue that you can speak about, especially when a country like Nigeria has been identified as a country in terms of association with the existence of terrorists or terrorism. So you've said then... So the answer we should give right. is to explain the effort the government is making in order to control and contain the challenge of insecurity. Because events happening here anymore are no longer secret. In fact, honestly, this reporter will come because preventive diplomacy has failed. One would hope. It is now damage control that we'll be talking about. Damage control diplomacy, not, not preventive. You get my point. So our response should be agenda for containing and controlling the challenges of insecurity a new strategy, something convincing to us in Nigeria and to the international community. Okay, so you're saying that that's how the government should have responded De to the definitely. report. Definitely. If we talk about the content of the report, yes. she did, well, the, the rapporteur did make claims that Nigeria itself could mm. be responsible for the spread of insecurity throughout the West African region. Of course. Very strong claims. Do you agree with those? Of course. In what way would Nigeria you, be responsible? Because we know that there's an insecurity across the Sahel region. The, That's not just Nigeria. They're no, no, having their own No, the, the whole issue is this. Again, this issue of 
our claim and the international perception of Nigeria. Don't tell me that Nigeria is not a, an essential country in Africa. With Nigeria is a dominant and preeminent country in Africa. Anything that happens in Nigeria has a repercussion in, the, in Africa, particularly in West Africa. In, the, in all sincerity, Nigeria has been carrying the burden of all major African countries. We're talking about events in South Africa. If, when some people like us, our generation, speak about what happened in South Africa against Nigerians, we speak more in sorrow than anger. Uh, may I remind some people that I was one of the people who monitored the CODESA conference that led to the end of apartheid. Jerika Wachu was the leader, of, uh, was Minister of Foreign Affairs then. I was uh, uh, DGNI and, uh, and I was a member of the delegation. I was also a member of the monitor, the Nigerian delegates that monitored the election of uh, President Mandela. The leader of the delegation was the late uh, Garuba, Major General Joseph Garuba, who was then our uh, UN uh, ambassador. In fact, Nigeria has always been there, a frontline state. In fact, Nigeria made formidable enemies because of fight against apartheid. Well, Prof, I'm sure it's... So something. what I'm trying to say... There's anything good or bad in Africa, the reference will be Nigeria. Well, Prof, we'll get to that, I'm sure, particularly mm. the uh, state of relations yeah. between Nigeria and South Africa yeah. at the moment. But I'd like to ask you, what, what is the value of a special rapporteur's report? And I ask because in 2016, uh, the uh, rapporteur that was sent uh, accused Nigeria of being uncooperative. Although we protested, yes. and then we got an apology in return. Yes. Uh, so is the report just about perception, or the UN Human Rights Council could, uh, you know, sanction Nigeria? Because this report by Kalamada appears to be very harsh. Well, also, it's harsh for sure. Or if, if you like, put the word. It's strong. But as I said, it's a, a wake-up call. Because of the perception and the importance of the subject, the subject is Nigeria as a, a nation. The fear of the international community is real, given the, that the, the fact that Nigeria is a preeminent and prominent actor in African politics and within the international system. You read it, read it very high. So, in fact, the responsibility on Nigeria to be a pest setter is extremely important. It is what is uh, the challenge. The challenge, is, in brief, is fear of a spillover effect of what is happening in Nigeria. If it is bad, spreading across, particularly West Africa. Let's just take it. There's nothing to hide about the fact, about the issue of the uh, headsman. It occurred in Ghana. You say it yourself. You read about it. There was a decisive action. The country was saved the embarrassment in which we have found ourselves today. It couldn't be contained. It went viral from one end of the country. You saw it. You, have, uh, you saw what happened. You see people shouting 500 cows in their villages. From Kaora model to, to our people. Is it not? Is, is it, you are right, yourself. They also see it. They, they saw it too. What we see here, they see there. The danger is a perception of a responsibility, assignment of responsibility, whether it is obvious or indeed residual. And it can go both. You, you describe Nigeria yes. uh, in, many, in many factions as a pace setter yes. uh, in comparison to the, to the, to the region. Yes. But uh, I want to talk to you more about policing and what you think 
your what your ideas are of effective policing and whether or not Nigeria is a pace setter in that in that instance. Believe you are not. We are not. Because the greatest problem or tragedy of our country is to live in denial or delusional or looking for what we call Nigerian exceptionality. History seems to be constant and politics has rules. Almost a permanent one. Nations to be stable and peaceful. There are also basic rules. You can secure a country's stability, peace, and everything, including prosperity, through either a serious and a concentrated kind of leadership with vision and mission, dynamic and purposeful. Call him a hero. Heroes hero rule by their own grace. They take their countries along. They take their countries along. That's why sometimes it's difficult to succeed a hero. But well, if they institutionalize what they have achieved, countries, their countries benefit. Especially if those countries are like Nigeria, nations of uh, irrepressible. Let me, let me stop you there. Has Nigeria been no, able hold, to? No, hold on. Okay. Has, but don't, I... don't cut my thought. Sure. Uh, countries like Nigeria, who have what you call irreplaceable pluralism. Right. Multinational in every form and every ramification. You don't use one rule, one police system, one police ideology, one police uh, priority to govern every place. A country like Nigeria, require, as you grow, you, your comp problems become more complex. Then you, you, you adjust. That's how to grow. Not static, static and there's resistance of change. Or re resisting the obvious, the inevitable. And for us, all these two words I'm using, delusion and self-denial, leads to one thing. There's no crisis in Nigeria that is new on, on, under the earth or history. But what we do is our small problems we deny that they exist. We delude ourselves it cannot happen here until they grow from simple issues, simple problems to national disaster. In fact, sometimes we only get attention of our problem when it's heading towards national calamity. It's that is the, that is, the, that is that. the meaning of this uh, Kalama is, is report. Up. Are our issues with insurgency, especially in the north of this country, are they a result of ignoring small problems and waiting for them to get Of bigger? course. Of course. Oh. When, when it occurred, let me be frank with you. When this thing was happening, you would not say that uh, 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 many Nigerians didn't know that we are a problem in the northeast. And when the problem came, with laxity, nonchalance, Self denial, the thing kept moving up. Well, Prof, you, you mentioned two things. Yes. Uh, it's just that we don't seem to have much time. Oh, yeah. The first is what you said about Nigerian exceptionalism. Yes. Exceptionalism is at the heart of the American foreign policy process. Yes. Do you see that in our own foreign policy process today, particularly with regards to how the federal government handled the recent report of xenophobia, you know, and attacks on Nigerians in South Africa? Definitely. definitely. It's the correct thing to do. They, they did well in, in, in South Africa, it's particularly the rescue of Nigerian citizens. The statement of the government itself. You, you get my point. If, when you, a, a situation of that nature exists, your citizens become very vulnerable. They want to know that they have support. That makes them more patriotic and better citizens than being ignored. It was a wonderful response by the government in this South African episode. But what should, I mean, President Buhari is going to visit South Africa. What do you think ah. should be on his, uh, on his uh, shopping list? Believe on his me, basket, South, Africa, his South Africa stands and remains one of Nigeria's most important partners in Africa. We, the country's leaders knew this from the beginning made investment 
and sacrifice to free South Africa from apartheid. It is this recognition that South Africa and Nigeria combined can determine the destiny of Africa. How? South Africa is highly industrialized. Believe me, Nigeria, with West African countries, form more than 50% of the population. Wonderful trade partners, political partners, if possible, and so on and so forth. So South Africa, our president going to South Africa is a very uh, important visit to, to strengthen the bilateral relation with South Africa and define part of that relationship. But the, econ the economic relationship between the two countries haven't, hasn't really been in doubt. Rather, it's on a societal level, how, how South Africans have been receiving Nigerians. That is the crux of the issue. So what do you think the president is going to do to change that, to make sure that these things don't happen? The, this is where we're always wrong. Many things are interlinked. I'll quote one of the heroes I love in, in politics, Atatok. Kemal Atatok. Kemal, oh, wow. Kemal Mustafa Atatok, I paraphrase, I paraphrase what he said. If anybody loves your country, he will love your leaders. If he loves your leader, he will love your country. And indeed, emotions and sentiments matter a lot, even in politics, even though people think you have to isolate one for the other. At a particular level, interdependence works better in countries where the two groups are friendly. We should know how to uh, cultivate the friendship of some countries through bilateral and consistent a follow-up. Let's talk about the ongoing United Nations uh, General Assembly, yes. the 74th uh, General Assembly. Uh, yesterday was a special summit on Climate. climate, yes. You know, and uh, the need for multilateral action on climate change, on poverty eradication, on uh, nutrition, yes. on inclusion, and all of that. And the president spoke, you know, at the climate action uh, uh, summit. Mm -hmm. But on the issue of uh, the uh, climate crisis that yes. the world faces, yes. it looks like uh, there is no collective will. Uh, particularly on the part of the political leaders. You have China, Argentina, Brazil, United <laughs> States, making it look like it's not a big deal. And uh, yet you have Germany, France, you know, yes. and uh, some other countries, New Zealand, yes. say, and a young girl, you know, Greta Thunberg, 16-year-old, yes, you know, saying, look, our world faces a serious crisis. Yes. <laughs> Where do you stand no, in the no, debate? Where I stand is an international relations, a foreign policy of nations. Every nation is there in the UN or any other international gathering to defend their own and protect their own national interest. Mm. Believe me, you get involved to the extent that your interest is involved, and at the scale, your, well, your interest is also involved. And you act to the level of the hierarchy of the power you have either to impose their view or support the view of others. So what I'm trying to say is that in the international community, you are doing a game of selective justice, hmm. selective engagement, <laughs> based on your national interest. Hmm. To be candid, it is a, a game, as I said, of selective morality, and outrageous paradox. You support one thing, and another person, if it's not in their interest, sometimes you can begin supporting something, midway you, you are persuaded that it's not even in your interest, either by, by advisors at home or advisors outside, mm -hmm. or by what you have had, somebody will do, do, do uh, with the policy you are pursuing. So in other words, there's no morality in international there is, diplomacy. There is morality. Morality, to say about that there's no morality means that there's no principle. But besides principle or morality, there is uh, power, principle, and pragmatism. What you are interested for the moment, you do. The issue is that the issue of, econ uh, of uh, 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 
problem of uh, climate change and all the rest of them, or climate problem. Many countries see it as a threat to their own economy. <laughs> <laughs> and they will never... It's going to be a threat to many things. They, they, they will economy. not join you to say, end it. <laughs> you have mentioned Brazil. Mm. And you mentioned the United States. You mentioned China. Yes. Go on, you will see many industrialized countries, super, super, super nations, will be opposed about this. Uh, then Sweden will be in favor. <laughs> then Finland. Because not... their countries depend uh, on, uh, on uh, Iceland. <laughs> Iceland, <laughs> there will be. Right. Then Nigeria has a dilemma. Our objective is to industrialize. Sometimes a realistic Nigerian will ask himself, how much can we pollute in order for us to develop? It is the living that enjoys good climate. Even though the bad climate may be killing you, but it's a matter of if I go, it's called necessity for choice. And the choice is based on national interest that it serves you at the moment of participation. I don't want to be a prophet, but any movement, any idea that the major powers do not support, will not succeed. No amount of sentiment will, do, will happen. You said uh, uh, the American group spent only a few minutes and they left. Yes. Good. What of China? Were they there? China was not there. Good. Saudi Arabia was not of there. Of course. And that's climate change solving. That is it. These are those who can change the climate. <laughs> <laughs> are you following? I get your point. Good. The, in fact, economic and national interest is involved. It's like when I, I, I speak about our country, don't deceive yourself that there's nothing, it's anything new. We're a complex society. When we talk restructuring, we mean put Nigeria in order so that it will be more effective. It is no threat to anybody or any group. But then, when we talk about state police, for example, people say it can't work. If he can't work, and you say that the governor is a <laughs> chief security of his uh, state, he, has, he, he doesn't even have Boy Scouts. <laughs> the police doesn't belong to him. And you say he is in charge. In a matter of uh, security crisis we have, you need a decentralization of, honestly speaking, I, I told somebody, how can you send a... Uh, uh, Okoro, an Igbo policeman, to go to Sekoto to catch a thief. You, you know what I mean? It's, I don't, actually. Please explain more. Explain what the, you mean. Policing also includes cultural understanding your environment. Being, in fact, being part of that environment will help you to detect crime and prevent crime. That's how complex societies are built. They go like that. In our own, you say, no, we must have one central police. You know what I mean? Of course, there is nothing happening with uh, having a federal police. It's there. It's no threat. But the same accusation about uh, state police will um, uh, oppress people. It is the same, the same uh, offense that the federal police is also accused of. So the issue, well, I'm trying to relate to the situation here, where interest determines what how a nation is governed, the same way and the same pattern at the international level. People can carry emotion to the level of ridiculousness. That's what I'm talking about. People can carry their own interests to extreme, in fact, to the detriment of the national idea, to the detriment of international peace and security, to the detriment of international health. You, you get my point. It depends upon what priority the ruling elite or the powerful group within a society or within a group or within an international system want to go. The issue is there are certain things, when their time has come, you can't change anything. You must be compared to deal with it. In Nigeria, the insecurity problem in Nigeria has come. It's not going away. 
Because when he comes, he comes with the law of surreality. He moves forward and expands. You were talking about the, not, uh, the Boko Haram. Under Jonathan, in fact, the, I can use the word, it was quarantined. You know what I mean by quarantine? It existed in one small place. The whole insecurity we were worried about has spread across the whole country. And that's why the international concern has also gotten involved because of the, what I call, the spillover effect or the kind of negative influence it can have in other countries in Africa, which is true. That when you know the population of Nigeria or the population of Nigerians across the West African <laughs> countries, you would never, never believe that we have that type of population in some countries. And that's what is a problem. That's why it's imperative for Nigeria to wear its foreign policy, as we said today. If we get there to the UN, the president has a is very lucky. We have a very lucky president, a lucky government. Because I want to answer the question about what would they do with the report. We are very lucky. If we, we have time to take measures to contain and control how the future reaction of the international community will be so that it doesn't reach the level of sanction. Because if they submit a report, they will also see what influence the report has had on us. Because they say, we will help you if you are doing some reforms. So but, but if we take it and uh, with the kind of report uh, responses I've been hearing, and you don't do any, you think you are wrong, you're, everybody, the report is wrong. That is not how to handle it. Mr. President, if I were his advisor, I would say, please get a small committee to look at that report and give me the way forward. Working paper on what to do to redress the challenge of insecurity in Nigeria. All your major advisors will only advise you only on what they think you are, you would like. But that's not always good. It's not always good. All critics are not enemies of their government. Many critics are patriotic people. So if they are critical about certain things, look into it. You must begin to change the image at home so that it will affect the image abroad. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, we're already at the international image level with this report anyway. Definitely. Which isn't positive, as you've admitted. Yes. So I, you, you mentioned that the pres if you were the president, you'd, you'd put a team together Definitely. and you'd, you'd, you'd identify reasons or ways in which things can change. And then what? Then what he, happens then? Then he will implement it if he's serious. But if you're not serious, set up 20 committees. So that isn't what's happening now? No. The, even if it's happening, that is no, it has no effect on what has happened. Sure. You get the point. You see, whatever you're doing on your, for yourself doesn't matter. It is what the people will see. Not even saying, I have intention. <laughs> you, uh, you understand? What I'm saying is that actionable recommendations, which actions can be taken. For example, I believe, I must say in the event here, we cannot solve the problem of present system of insecurity the way we are without having a declaration of state of emergency on security and getting the headsmen stop moving around the country. It's a source of insecurity. In fact, fear, if you don't want to call it insecurity, it's fear. People are afraid of going through the roads. Isn't that true? Well, in one village. And for, you know, so we have to take the right action to expect the right result. I want to quote Einstein. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is madness. Prof, we have just about one minute to go. Yes. But I would like to ask you about our foreign policy process. In recent times, we've had a number of challenges. 
um, the closure of the border with, uh, yes. Yes. with uh, Benin Republic, yes. uh, the crisis in South Africa, yes. and so many other things. What, what do you think should be the uh, focus? Because we can't keep saying Africa is the centerpiece of uh, our foreign policy process, mm. and yet we are having problems within Africa. You see, oh. there's nothing, that, nothing very constant in, the, in uh, what do you call uh, relations among nations, international relations. There's nothing more constant than ingratitude. <laughs> ingratitude is a virtue. Because gratitude is a burden. <laughs> you carry it for a while and you want to get out of it. You must know that. Well, on that note, Prof, we have to thank you very much for coming to the morning show. <laughs>